today at all of our live churches as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus in this Christmas season. Today, we're launching into a new message series called The Gift. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at three different gifts that some wise men gave to Jesus around the time of his birth from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter two. Let me give you the context of Matthew two, and then we're gonna dive into God's word today. Uh, If you don't know the story, Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of King Herod, and some wise men, or you might call them magi, traveled a great distance to come and worship Jesus. Now, how many wise men were there? How many of you have maybe a nativity scene at your house, your grandma has a nativity scene, raise your hand, all of our churches. If you look at the nativity scene, how many wise men do you always see? You always see three wise men. How many wise men were there? We don't know. (laughs) We tend to think that there were three because they perhaps brought three gifts. But the reality is we have no idea how many there were. Chances are there could have been dozens, but tradition tells us three. What we do know for sure is that these wise men were highly educated. They were very likely incredibly wealthy, and they were desperate to meet the one who might be the savior of the world. Scripture tells us this, when they saw the star, Matthew chapter two, verse 10, They were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped Jesus. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Admittedly, when we had six children, we received no gold, frankincense or myrrh. What in the world kind of gifts are those? When we had babies, we got diapers, we got onesies, we got passies. We got the ever important, all purpose, baby snot sucker. Very important gift. We grew up in the era when it was blue and you pushed a button, you know, squeezed it and it came out. Evidently now, they have new more modern version ones where you can actually suck the snot out yourself. Dear God, why is that possible? I have no idea. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just thank God in heaven, but it is a real thing. You can suck the snot out of your own baby's nose if you so choose. The wise men offered three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts were not only valuable, they were incredibly practical, and yet they were deeply spiritual. In fact, all Bible scholars agree that these gifts were not only useful for this family, and I'll tell you why as we go through the weeks, but they also foreshadowed some images of what Jesus would represent. Gold, valuable in itself, represented the kingship of Jesus. Myrrh, we're gonna talk about next week. Myrrh represented Jesus as the suffering servant or as the lamb of God. Today, we're gonna talk about frankincense. Before I tell you the meaning of frankincense, I'll tell you a little bit about frankincense. According to my essential oil advisors, (laughs) of which I have many in my life. Um, Frankincense is an oil that's kind of like a Swiss army knife. In other words, it's got lots and lots of purposes. Um, I do know some about oils because my wife Amy uses them, peppermint for your stomach, lavender for something. She has this one oil, it smells so bad, I call it the not tonight oil, okay? (laughs) If she comes in wearing that, it's like, okay, I get it, I get it. It's the not tonight oil. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know if you live there or not, but that's just how it goes at our home. Uh, Let me tell you what I know about frankincense. Frankincense oil possesses antiseptic, astringent, carminative, diuretic, digestive, sedative, uterine, and vulnerary therapeutic properties. I don't know what that means, but I read it somewhere. What does a pastor do all week besides preach on Sundays? We look up stuff like this, that's what we do. What I do know is that frankincense was a very expensive practical gift that helped heal sicknesses or treat wounds. More so, frankincense was the oil that the priests would use during the sacrifices 
to burn the incense that then make the smoke that would arise to heaven, symbolizing the prayers of the people rising in faith to God. And that is why Bible scholars agree that frankincense represents the priestliness of Jesus, or as we're gonna talk about today, Jesus our high priest. Now, some of you, if you weren't raised Catholic or such, you may be confused right now. Why would Jesus be the high priest? What I wanna do today is maybe just a little bit different than normal. I'm gonna get a little bit deeper and bring kind of some heady teaching. If you can handle it, say I can handle it. Can you handle it? I'm not sure I heard from you all in Wellington or in Tennessee or in Texas or in Albany. If you can handle it, say I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's dive in. Jesus the high priest. Uh, the priest in scripture served one big um, primary role that was broken into two functions. The priest essentially would be the representative of the people before God. I'm gonna represent you to God if I'm the priest. And the priest's uh, primary role was broken into two functions. First, the priest made sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. As the priest, he would take an innocent animal, sacrifice it to represent the forgiveness of the people's sins. Secondly, the priest prayed prayers on behalf of the people to God, representing the people to God. I wanna talk for a moment about those two functions as we see Jesus as our high priest. The sacrifices and the prayers, the sacrifices and the prayers. Let's start with the sacrifice for our sins. Since the very moment in the Garden of Eden when uh, Eve sinned against God, there were two opposing forces. There was the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. The holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. Now, admittedly in our culture today, a lot of people don't wanna say we actually sin. They might say we made a mistake, but it's not a sin. You know, who's to tell me I sinned? If it feels good, do it. You know, it, you know what's good to me is true to me, is true to you, so, so what you do is your life, and, and you know, who needs sin? One person said that sin is a very outdated term to trick children to being good. In other words, who needs sin when you've got an elf on a shelf, right? <laughs> who can tell you what your kids are doing and tell Santa, who's making his list and checking it twice and gonna find out who's naughty and nice, okay? Here, here's the, the challenge. We have to understand the reality of sin because there's the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. If we don't understand the holiness of God, we'll always have a casual approach to sin. Until we understand what it truly means that God is holy, we'll never realize the cost and the tragedy of what sin does to us. God is holy, the holiness of God. What does it mean that God is holy? Uh, the word holy comes from a Greek word hagios, which it means uh, separate, it means other. What is, what is God? God is transcendently separate. Our God is perfect in every single way. He is flawless, he is pure, there is no fault, no wrong, no stain in him. Our God is transcendently other, he's separate, he is perfect. And so we need to understand that holiness isn't just one of the attributes of God. Holiness is the perfection of all of his attributes. His power is holy. His grace is holy. His mercy is holy. His glory is holy. It's his holiness, his otherness, his separateness, his purity that makes him worthy of our praise. Our God is holy and our challenge is we're not. None of us are. Not a single one of you. Not you, not that really nice person you know at work, not me. Scripture teaches us that every single one of us, we've all sinned, we've done something wrong. We've fallen short of God's standard and sin breaks our intimacy with a holy God. This is why God hates sin because it's everything he's not. It's the opposite of his holiness. It disrupts our intimacy, his fellowship with us, and sin separates us from God and it breaks our life, it destroys our life, and therefore God hates sin. The holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. 
the high priest in the Old Testament, one time a year would make a sacrifice as a temporary payment for the sins of the people. It was known as the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, and the priest would sacrifice an innocent animal and go into the tabernacle behind the veil into a place known as the Holy of Holies. The priest then would light the frankincense and the incense would let smoke rise burning to heaven, represent the cries of the people of God to mercy, for mercy. And then the priest would take the blood of the innocent animal and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. This would symbolize the death of an innocent one in place of the guilty ones as a payment for our sins. Then, have any of you ever heard of a goat before? Scapegoat? Anybody heard of a scapegoat? Anybody heard of a scapegoat? The term came from this. The priest would take a goat, an innocent goat, and confess the sins of the people, symbolically transferring the sins onto the goat, and then they would drive the goat into the wilderness or sometimes like off a cliff. Therefore, the first animal died as a sacrifice paying the price for the sins. Symbolically, the scapegoat was run out of the community, symbolizing the sins had been separated from the people of God. May I pause for a moment and tell you, that's just weird. <laughs> right, I mean, like, if, you, if you think I've never heard this before, and you take an innocent, cute little animal, and you slit its throat, and blood pours into a bucket, you put it on a mercy seat, and then you pray. I mean, that's, that's like weird. Some of you are looking at me like you're really nervous, like God's about to strike your pastor. Poof. <laughs> I'm a black spot. <laughs> I don't know, right? It is weird. It's, it's extreme. It's kind of gross. It seems entirely unfair. And it's a little animal dying in a place. Who would come up with something like this? Here's what we have to understand. Because God is just, completely just, he must punish sin. But God is not only just, he is also merciful. And here's the beauty of what God does. The sacrifice satisfies God's justice and at the same time extends mercy. It is the price that is paid, but someone else pays that price for the forgiveness of sins. So God's holiness, his justice is satisfied, and yet he extends mercy to the people that he loves so much. This was a temporary covering under the old covenant, but we are not people of the old covenant, we're under the new covenant. And I wanna tell you about a new and a better sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, tells us a little bit about our great high priest. His name is Jesus, and he is the son of God. For God's will, scripture says, was for us to be made holy. We're not holy in and of ourselves, but it's God's will for us to be holy. How are we made holy? By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sin. It's only a temporary covering for sin. But our high priest, whose name is Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. I hope somebody gives our God a little bit of praise. It's not a temporary covering, but Jesus as the high priest offered his life, shedding his innocent blood as a covering for our sins, satisfying the justice of God and extending mercy to God's creation, you, who he loves so much. I wanna give you a visual of this because I know it's a little bit complicated at times. Uh, I'm gonna show you a uh, photo that uh, was taken 28 years ago this week. The reason I know it was this week 
is because it was on this day I tricked Amy to come up to the front of First United Methodist Church to give announcements, which she was doing there, and while she was up there, I proposed to her to be my wife, and she said yes, and my church celebrated because that's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. Oh, yeah. Would have been a really bad day if she had said no. I, I wanna point some things out to you from this, uh, this photo that I love. On the right, that's my pastor, Pastor Nick Harris, who is um, a hero, uh, legend, uh, one of the greatest men that I've ever met. On the left is my dear friend Jay. If you remember me telling the story about Jay, that's my, my dear friend Jay. If you'll notice to the... Um, if you notice my robe for a moment, there's no stripe on the robe. That's because I was not ordained. That was not a real pastoral robe. That was a choir robe that we found in the basement and the only one that I could wear because it didn't have a stripe on it. It's really bad, it smelled to the high heavens. It was horrible. It's kind of like the not tonight robe. If you could <laughs> be with me, it was horrible. And, uh, and I, if you'll notice, Pastor Jay and Pastor Nick are sitting in king-sized thrones. On the left is my junior throne for the guy with <laughs> no stripe on the robe. Uh, it was on a day when I was about 23 years of age or so, I was sitting up there in my very smelly, very ugly, stripeless, not tonight robe and my junior throne, and my pastor was preaching, and I had my leg crossed. I had one leg kind of sitting over the other leg because that looked like you were kind of pastoral. And what happened is my left side of my leg started to fall asleep. And I thought, hey, I'll just let this thing go, see how far it goes. And so I kind of <laughs> pinched it a little bit. And it, got, it got tingly in my, in my, in my uh, blessed assurance. It got tingly all the way down my side. And I just thought, this is kind of fun. You know, my pastor's preaching away. I'm having a good time and just let my leg fall asleep. Well, God is my witness. I served my pastor for five years. He never used me as a sermon illustration ever. Didn't tell me it was coming except for that very moment when half of my body was numb, he asked me to stand up. God is my witness. You don't think God has a sense of humor? God's like, going, wait for it, wait for it, now. <laughs> you know, and he has me stand up, and so I'm like, like, I couldn't even stand up. I'm, I'm standing on one leg like this. He's looking at me like I'm all, like, whatever. And he, he did this illustration, and he said, is your robe a nice robe? And I'm looking, I think it's a trick question. Like, if I say no, he's gonna get mad. I'm like going, uh, you go, and he kind of shakes his head like to say it's okay. I said, no. He says, is it a, is a bad robe? I'm like, yes. Is it a really bad robe? Yes, how bad is it? It's a stinky, smelly, bad robe. And then he said, is my robe nice? Yes, why? It's clean. It's got a stripe on it. It represents the priestly nature of the pastoral office. And, and then my pastor said, here's what Jesus did for us. He said, take off your filthy, smelly robe. I took it off. Then he took off his priestly robe and he put it over my shoulders. And he said, Jesus, our high priest, sacrificed his life so he could take his robes of righteousness, scripture says, and cover you with his Righteousness. It's not yours, it's his. So that whenever God looks at you, he doesn't see your sinfulness, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. This is our high priest who gave his life, satisfying the justice of God and simultaneously extending mercy. Jesus is our great high priest. He's not just a distant savior, though, that feels sorry for us. He is a high priest who understands and cares. Scripture says this about our high priest in Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 and 15. So then, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, he is our high priest. Since we have that high priest, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours, Jesus, he understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. I hope you'll understand and embrace the truth 
that whatever you're going through, Jesus understands. He relates to our trials. He sympathizes with our pain. Whatever you're going through at this very moment, He understands what you're going through. If you feel stressed right now and overwhelmed in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus' friends abandoned Him and He knew what was coming, He fell to the ground and He said, my soul is overwhelmed in agony to the point of death. If you face anxiety, He understands. If you deal with crazy people in your family, Jesus dealt with crazy people in his family. It's a spiritual principle. Every family has crazy. <laughs> Everyone does. All of our churches, everybody participating. How many of you have somebody crazy in your family? Raise up your hands. Raise up your hand. Hey, leave them up for a moment. Leave them up. Just leave them up. Leave them up for a moment. I want you to look around the room right now. Look around the room. Find whoever doesn't have their hand in the air and wink at them. Because every family has them crazy. It's a principle. When Jesus said, I am the Messiah, his family said, you're a lunatic. Think about how much Jesus understands so you can know how much he cares. Jesus was conceived out of wedlock to a teenage mom, scandalous. He was raised in a small town where everybody whispered about him and called him that bastard boy. Jesus lived in poverty. He was criticized. He was ridiculed. He was bullied. He was tempted by the devil again and again and again when he was at his weakest and most vulnerable, yet he did not sin. Jesus experienced the death of a close friend. He grieved the loss of family members. He was accused of things that he did not do. His friends betrayed him. Worst of all, he felt abandoned by God on the cross. He wasn't, but he felt that way. Because when Jesus, the great high priest, became sin for us, kind of like the scapegoat, gave his life for sin, God looked away. Why? Because God is too holy to look upon sin. And Jesus cried out in agony, my God, my God, where are you? If you've ever felt, like you couldn't reach the presence of God. Jesus understands. Whatever you feel, He felt. Wherever you hurt, He hurt. He's your great high priest who sympathizes and understands. He's not, he's not sitting in heaven going, well, it sucks to be you. No, He is our high priest who has experienced all the pain of being in a human body, all the emotion of being rejected by friends, all the agony of hurting, feeling alone, feeling abandoned. Imagine if you can, the details of our God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, John 1, 1. And the Word became flesh. God born in the form of a child who loves you, who cares about you. And God in His divine providence sent magi, wise men, to offer gifts prophetically declaring the nature of Jesus to come. Gold, he is our king. Myrrh, he's the suffering servant, the lamb of God. Frankincense, he is our high priest who would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins and pray prayers to our God in heaven. This is why scripture is so, so, so important. 
when it tells us this. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. What can you do, church? You can come boldly to him. You can come to him because he cares. You can come to him because he understands. Let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God, and then we will receive mercy. Why? His justice has been satisfied, and he extends mercy. And what will we find in our high priest? We will find grace to help us when we need it most. I hope you understand. You can come to him today. You can come to him as you are. You can come boldly. You don't have to cower when you come to him. You don't have to be afraid when you, when you come to him. You, you don't have to pray in King James language when you come to him. When my children come to their loving dad, their earthly father, they just jump in my lap. Joy, she's the baby. Oh, she knows she's the baby. She comes in my lap, she strokes my hair, she says, Daddy, I love you, I know you love me, I know I'm your favorite, Daddy. They're all my favorite, but no one can talk joy out of believing she's the absolute top favorite. I know I'm your favorite, Daddy, can I have $20? <laughs> and I give it to her every time. Why? Because I love her. We're in a relationship, and she comes boldly to my to my presence. Today what I wanna do is I wanna give you a chance, a little gift to spend a few moments with God in his presence. How long has it been since you've really enjoyed him? If you're hurting today, we're gonna to give our hurts to him. Come boldly before the throne of grace. At all of our churches, let me give you an opportunity in your own way, in your own style, just to go before God and talk to him. Let's just pray today at all of our different churches. Father, thank you that we have a great high priest, Jesus, who sacrificed his life for the forgiveness of our sins and who now prays for us, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, praying, making an intercession, for all of us today. Take a moment and just talk to him. He cares about you. He understands the details of your life. Those of you who have a loved one, maybe far from God, you might just, just say the name, whisper it or say it in your, your mind of who that is you love. And take that person before God. Understand that Jesus is praying for that person even now. Who is Jesus in this moment? He is, he is the high priest who is our savior. If you're struggling financially, you feel that very real weight of this world, so much, so many expenses, so, so few resources at times, just tell him, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm hurting. Jesus, your high priest, he is your provider. He meets all of your needs according to God's glory and riches in heaven. You're hurting emotionally, perhaps. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Your high priest is also your comforter. He's been where you've been. He hurts like you hurt. He understands. You're struggling physically. Or someone you love's had a bad medical report. Jesus, your high priest, bore stripes upon his back so that he could be your healer. Cry out to him. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're overwhelmed. You don't feel like you can hold it together. You're completely weak and broken. When you are weak, Jesus, the high priest, is your strength. He understands in your weakness, his strength is made complete. Call on him. He is your high priest. As you continue praying, in a moment, I'm going to ask those of you who need him as savior 
to lift up your hands. The holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Some of you, you're gonna recognize if we sat down and had a conversation and I ask you where you are spiritually, you might say, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I go to church or I kind of believe or I'm not sure what I believe. Let me be as clear as I can. Who is Jesus? He is your high priest. He is the Lamb of God. He was.
I wonder how many of you are ready to attack not only a new year, but a new decade at all of our churches today. A few of you, good. I, uh, I also wonder, is there anybody who would like to hear one of the most controversial parenting moments in my parenting career? You? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you this, so this is not your example. This isn't necessarily what you should do if faced with a similar situation. This will be debated for decades to come amongst the Groeschel families, whether I was honoring God or if I was sinning in a massive way. But I'll just tell you kind of what happened. Uh, my bride and best friend Amy is with me again in this service this weekend. Um, together, we created six kids. That is a basketball team with a sub. We have four daughters, we have two sons. Steven's my youngest son, Sam is my oldest. Whenever Sam was a little kid, about, about this big, I don't remember the exact age, um, small enough to play in the little playlands at a fast food restaurant where they have slides and little tunnels to crawl through and such. Well, Sam was in there playing um, very innocently when a bigger kid that looked like he was maybe two years older or so came up to Sam unprovoked for no reason and just laid into him pushed him as hard as he could in the chest, and Sam just fell backwards, blindsided, looked up at me, feelings hurt, embarrassed, as if to question, Dad, can I defend myself? And I looked back at Sam, and I just kind of gave him this little nod, no, just, just lay low, just be cool, and he kind of said, okay, and he was obedient, and this kid came up a second time, and laid into Sam, pushed him harder than you could imagine, right in the chest, and he fell back down, looked back up at me with this just raw intensity, and kind of like, can I, Dad? And I said, walk away, just walk away, walk away. And so Sam, obviously wanting to defend his honor, obediently turned his back and started walking away, and the third time, the kid came up and just laid into him, pushed him from the back, Sam fell on his face, this time, the tears were coming out. He looked at me as if for permission, and I just nodded and said, take him. <laughs> take him. I'm not sure if God is pleased, I'm not sure if God is disappointed, but Sam obediently put his shoulder down, laid into this kid, lifted him off the ground, power slammed him on the ground, and started issuing the judgment of God upon <laughs> this bully. Knowing as a man of God, as a follower of Jesus, and as a pastor, it would be the right thing to do for me to break up the fight. So I took a moment to pray and ask God for wisdom <laughs> as to when exactly I should step in. And once I listened quietly for the still small voice of God, he prompted me to walk slowly over and physically remove my son from this bully. Again, that's not the model, just kind of what happened. It is a new year, and it is a new decade. And I'm hoping, sensing, and maybe even believing that there are some of you that are getting sick and tired of being pushed around. I'm guessing there are some of you that since it's time for you to fight back, that there is a battle for you to win. Maybe it's a habit that you need to break. Maybe it's a relationship that you need to attempt to mend. Maybe it's debt that you need to eliminate. Maybe it's a discipline that you need to start. Maybe it's a temptation that you continue to give in to and it's time with the help of Jesus to conquer. Today, we are starting a message series called Warrior. And I'm wondering if there are any warriors anywhere in the house today. It's okay to grunt. It's okay to give a little roar. It's okay to roar. This is not Planet Fitness a competition-free zone where you're not allowed to grunt or drop your weights in an aggressive manner on the ground. You can slam those things down all you want right here. I'm talking to some warriors. I wanna be really, really clear about my motivation. Over the next four weeks, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically to the men. 
because I feel like I'm more qualified to talk to the men and because honestly, gentlemen, every now and then, we just need a kick in the you know where. I'm gonna talk a little more directly to the men. But at the same time, I wanna say to the ladies, I will not leave you out at all and I wanna acknowledge very, very clearly that some of the fiercest warriors I know are female warriors. You wanna see someone with faith to push back the powers of darkness when my bride Praise the devil flees and heaven opens up. You wanna see anyone who's got some fight in them, let me just give you some advice. Do not ever, under any circumstances, mess with a mama bear. <laughs> Ladies, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I celebrate you as warriors, I embrace you as warriors. I am gonna talk a little more specifically to the men because I believe there's a lot of confusion in today's culture on what it means to be a man. Are we supposed to be powerful? Or are we supposed to be gentle? Are we supposed to be strong? Or are we supposed to be weak? In fact, even when you look at Jesus, when I was growing up, the church kind of portrayed Jesus just as a meek and mild, poor Galilean that was good with sheep and kids, okay? And yes, he was full of love, and he is full of mercy, and he is full of grace, and yet at the very same time, in the same body, is the fiercest, spiritual warrior who has ever lived. Gentlemen, I believe that our God has created you with the heart of a warrior. And I wanna look at the nature of God, and I wanna look at the person of Jesus to lay a foundation, and then we're going to look at three callings that every warrior must embrace. Let's talk about the nature of God. What I love about God among so many things, there are so many metaphors you cannot just put God in a box. He's called the shelter. He's called your hiding place. He's called a great fortress. He's called your rock. He's also called a warrior. In fact, the word of God says in Exodus chapter 15 of God, the Lord is a what? Let's say it aloud. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Even Jesus, who was full of mercy, and compassion could put up a spiritual fight. He said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 34, do not suppose I've come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. In fact, there's this really, really powerful and kind of cocky story of um, Jesus in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter four, when Jesus was teaching in Nazareth and the crowd didn't like his message. They thought he was blasphemous or whatever, and so this big mob of angry people charged Jesus and essentially pushed him to the edge of the cliff, and Luke says they were about to push him over the edge of the cliff when all we know is Jesus turned and looked at the crowd. And when he turned, the crowd parted, and he walked through the crowd. That's cocky. That's cocky. We don't know why the crowd parted. I have some theories. Jesus was a carpenter. I'm guessing on that day, he was wearing a sleeveless robe. <laughs> Boys, I can introduce you to grace and truth, but before you experience grace, you gotta meet truth. And the crowd parted, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was just a look in his eye, but whatever it was, when a whole crowd was gonna push him off the cliff, when he turned, they said, oh, excuse me, sir, you're welcome to go this way. The crowd parted. And ultimately, Jesus fought and won the most important battle in the history of the world. When Jesus was obedient to God the Father, gave his life on the cross, defeated death, hell, sin, and the grave, he is the greatest warrior of all time. And when, this warrior, the Son of God, returns. John had a vision of him while exiled to the Isle of Patmos. It's recorded in Revelation 19. John had the vision of the returning warrior, Jesus, and said, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. 
Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations on his robe and on his thigh. He has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is a soon returning conquering king and a warrior who wins every battle that he fights. I don't know about you, but when the guy who was raised from the dead comes back on a white horse in a robe dipped in blood with a sword coming out of his mouth, I want to be on that warrior's team. Jesus was full of mercy, full of compassion, and was the greatest warrior who ever lived. Men and women, ladies and men, you're all warriors, and I believe that God has given every warrior three things. I want to talk about those three things today. God has given every single one of you as a warrior someone to protect, a kingdom to advance, and a battle to win. Let's talk about it, warriors. Number one, God has given every warrior someone to protect. I love the words of Nehemiah when he was advancing the kingdom, when he was fighting the battle, when he was rebuilding the walls, and the enemies tried to stop the work of God, Sanballat and Tobiah and others, hurling insults and even threatening their lives. And Nehemiah had a brave heart moment when he stands up and he says to everybody, don't be afraid of them, your enemies. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I wanna to talk to some warriors today, not just men, but men of God, and tell you, get up off the sofa, put down the video game, fight for your families, Fight for your homes, fight for purity, fight for victory, fight for generosity, fight for righteousness. God has given you someone to protect. You need a little motivation? Read Jesus and watch Liam Neeson. Seriously, like, read Jesus and watch a Liam Neeson movie, right? right? Think about him, Liam Neeson. He fought for his family in Taken One. He fought for his family in Taken Two. He fought for his family in Taken 3. He fought for his family in the commuter. He fought for his family in the cold pursuit. This guy needs a new role. Fight for your families. God has given you someone to protect. And here's what I know about you, gentlemen. You don't have to be some testosterone-infused gym rat. You can be smaller in stature, quiet by nature. If someone breaks in to hurt someone you love, you will fight to the death. It's inside of you. You, you may be generally timid. Someone comes in to hurt your daughter, you get out of your bed in your tidy whities You will turn a lamp into a weapon and fight to the death because you're a warrior. There's something in you that will righteously die to protect someone you love. I would say to you warriors, don't just be willing to die for those you love to protect them, be willing to live to protect them. And not just physically, that's second nature. But gentlemen, as warriors, you protect them emotionally. One of the great tragedies of our day and throughout history is that there are so many women who have been abused by the power of men gone wrong. There should never be a woman or a child ever in the presence of a man of God that should feel anything but safe. They should always feel physically and emotionally safe. Not only will I protect Amy's physical nature, but I wanna protect her heart, meaning I want her to know that I'll live with integrity and she doesn't have to worry about me straying into trouble. I want her to feel protected financially. One of the things that women generally value is a sense of financial security. When we don't feel like we have the financial security, there's, 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 no, there's, not, there's, there's tension. And so what I wanna do is I wanna lead our family to always have a little bit of margin and to provide for her in that way. We'll set the tone if you'll step in and lead. I don't wanna just protect physically and just emotionally and just financially, but I wanna protect those around me spiritually. That means we are people of God, we are followers of Christ. We are in church every single week. There has never been, you can ask my kids, ask them, is there ever a week where a kid wakes up and comes in and says, hey, are we going to church this week? That's not a question. And it's not because I am Pastor Craig, it's because I am follower of Christ Craig. 
My children want to be in here because we have raised them. We don't miss a week of life, kids, because they need the strength of the body of Christ to empower them as little warriors. We don't miss a week of switch because we are here to serve others and to be served and strengthened by the body of Christ. If a kid gets the wrong influence, the wrong friend, as a warrior, as a protective father, it's my role to step in and say, no, nah, let's go another way. This is not, the, we're not gonna hang out with these types of people. Gentlemen, you have that right. You should be involved. You owe it to them. You have someone to protect. I told you I've got two sons. I've also got four daughters, three of whom are now married. That only leaves Joy, the baby, and Joy will tell you that I'm crazy about Joy. If you wanna date one of my daughters, they're all drop dead gorgeous like their mom. They're all beautiful. If you wanna date my remaining daughter or any of my daughters, you need to know the first date's always with me. <laughs> it is, and it's not a fun date. <laughs> first one's with me. You wanna go out with one of my girls? Then we gotta go through a little process. And we do an interview. And no matter how much you prepare, you will not be adequately prepared for what you're going to endure. And you would probably say, oh, I bet your girls hate that and so do the guys. So the guys do dread it, but um, those who haven't made the cut, I've received thank you notes from all of them saying thank you for helping develop me spiritually. And my daughters, after those meetings, it's the most special time, when they come run to me and they hug me and say, Daddy, what'd you think? Did you like him? Did you believe in him? Do you like, Daddy, thank you so much for, for protecting me. Thank you so much for caring. This isn't controlling, this is protecting. Gentlemen, it's in you. You're a warrior. God has given you someone to protect. I love what 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12 even says. This is what we're to be. We're to be strong and fight bravely for our people and for the cities of our God. God has given you someone to protect, and he's given you a kingdom to advance. He's given you a ministry to fulfill, a kingdom to advance. Luke's Gospel, chapter nine, verse one. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim what? Say it aloud. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Gentlemen, you have a kingdom to advance. We're told in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 6, that we are to seek first the kingdom of God, not our own kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto us. We're told that when you pray, this is how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said this, he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. In other words, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You have power, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You have a kingdom to advance. This is your ministry. This is your contribution. You're called by Jesus, the light of the world. You are a heavenly ambassador. You're the highest ranking diplomat sent by God from heaven to earth to represent the love of God. God even gave you gifts and talents and passion and would save you by grace, but yet prepared good works in advance for you to do. Gentlemen, you may be the brightest light in your office. You may be the only spiritual light in your office. You're advancing the kingdom. You may be great at business. Be great at business. Conquer. Take ground. Make money and give generously. You may be the most generous person at your campus, funding the Bible app, funding new campuses, giving to ministries, helping single moms. You may have a heart for teenagers. And so every week, you're at switch. You may be the only godly warrior example some other teenager ever sees, and you stand in with strength every week, showing this is what it's like to be a man of God. Or your battle may be invisible to most, but not invisible to God. Your battle may be in the closet. You fight on your knees in your prayer closet, doing warfare, believing by faith, calling angels to protect, and pushing back the forces of darkness. Gentlemen, it's in you, it's hardwired in you. You've got someone to protect. 
And you've got a kingdom to advance. You've got a cause worth fighting for. Here's the problem, is if you're not engaged in your cause, if you're not fighting for the right cause, as men, we tend, up to, to, tend to fight against the wrong things. Some of you, you've been fighting against authority your whole life. Ain't nobody gonna tell me what to do. You stay out of my life, I got this. Fighting against authority. Because you're not fighting for your cause. Some of you, you're fighting against your wife. You, you're, 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 fighting against, you're fighting against God. You're fighting against boredom. Doing stupid things with the gifts that God gave you. Some of you, you're fighting against the very people who are trying to help you most. What happened? Somewhere along the way, you had a kingdom to advance and you got distracted. You got distracted. You are called to more than sitting on a sofa. You're called more, to, to, to more than being great at golf. You're called to more than just having a nice car and a nice house. You were created for more than that. Don't get distracted. The problem is, a distracted warrior is always a destructive warrior. Gentlemen, do not abandon your post. Do not abandon your calling. Do not surrender that which you were called to do. God created you with the heart of a warrior, with someone to protect, a kingdom to advance, and also a battle to win. In fact, David said this of God in Psalm uh, 144, verse one. He said, praise be to the Lord God, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. Even my God, I have a heart for him. He trains me to be ready for battle. He trains my hands and my fingers for war. Gentlemen, remember, ladies, remember, Christianity is not a playground. It is a battleground, and we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this dark world. There's fight in you. Just let it come to life. The problem is, some of you right now, I, I hope that it is, you recognize I'm called to it, there's more in me, I'm not gonna sell out, I'm not gonna sit back, I will engage in the battle. The problem is, so often, you realize there's someone to protect a kingdom to advance, a battle to win, and all of a sudden you say, I'm ready to slay the dragon! And then you remember, my car needs an oil change, <laughs> right? I'm ready to vanquish the enemy! Oh my gosh, what did I do? The credit card came due for my Christmas gifts, I'm dead. And so often, what you feel in your heart and desire in your soul is so much different than what you see day to day. How do you, as a warrior, step into your mission, pleasing your heavenly commander, living for his purposes to glorify his name, protecting those you love, advancing the kingdom, and winning the battle that is before you? How do you do this? Let me give you two statements, and I hope these are very clear. May they empower you, may they motivate you, may they equip you and strengthen you to do his will. I hope that you'll understand that victory isn't always what you conquer later, but victory is being faithful and obedient today. I wanna say it again, you don't win, you don't it's not the moment of victory when you finally throw the stone and take the giant down. David was victor victorious when he showed up and served the brothers with crackers and cheese before the battle. Victory isn't just what you conquer in the future. True victory is honoring God, being faithful and obedient today. Think about Jesus, the greatest warrior of all time. He wasn't just victorious when he gave his life on the cross and God raised him from the dead. He was also victorious after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came at him three different times trying to take him away from the will of God. The first time, the devil said, hey, I know you're hungry. You've got power. Turn these stones into bread. 
and Jesus drew the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and fought back and said, no, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, and he was victorious in that moment. Then the devil said, hey, why don't you jump off the cliff? If you jump off this cliff, God will give his angels charge over you. And Jesus drew the sword again and said, no, it is written, thou shalt not put the Lord your God to test. And he was victorious in that moment. A third time, the devil said, hey, look at all the riches. I'll give you all power, all glory, and all riches if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone. And Jesus was victorious in that moment. Victory is not what you accomplish somewhere later in the future. It's when you're faithful and obedient today. Jesus was victorious when he protected a broken woman from an angry mob and wanted to stone her. He was victorious on that day. He was victorious when he walked into the temple. And it was being misused. And he overturned the tables and said, you don't take my father's house, a place meant for worship, and use it for your own selfish gain. You see, gentlemen, sometimes you turn a cheek and sometimes you turn a table. There is a time that's right to throw a punch. In the garden, Jesus knelt down and prayed, Father, may this cup be removed from me. And every demonic voice from hell said, don't go through with it, Jesus. And Jesus was victorious when he said, yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus stripped naked, hanging on a cross, taking abuse, people spitting on him, dying slowly. And he was victorious when he did not retaliate. He could have called down legions as angels, but instead he looked up to heaven and said, Father, please, Have mercy on them, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And Jesus was victorious when he said, it's finished. In other words, every day, every moment, I was faithful and obedient, not just in the moment where he gave his life, but in every day, ordinary days, he was faithful and obedient. And then he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he gave his life. God raised him from the dead. And he was victorious on that day because he was faithful to his assignment that day. What's your battle? Like seriously, what's the battle that you gotta fight and win? I want you to name one, not two, not three, that's too many, one. And with the help of the power of God, You will win that battle today. What's your heavenly assignment? Someone to protect? A kingdom to advance? Engage in ministry? A battle to win. What's your battle? Name it. Defeat it. Some of you, it's it's time to take care of your body. It's your battle. Listen, the power of the risen Christ in you is stronger than what's on the other side of that fork. Come on, somebody. I got a buddy, he said that, uh, he goes, man, if, the, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I'm living in a mega church. <laughs> well, that's funny. Hey, come on, right? For some of you, that's it. Let's, get, let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's get in shape. Let's take care of our bodies. Let's be there for our families. Some of you, it's a debt to eliminate. Come on, man. You wanna hurt like this three years from now? Five years from now, 10 years from now, still in debt, still worried all the time, do something about it. Come on, you got a brain? You got a no button? No, we're not buying that. Declare war, take it down. Be financially free, have a spirit of generosity. Some of you, you've been passive spiritually, playing little video games. Getting a real battle, man. Out there working, hey, gonna have these nice things, nice things, nice things, nice things. While your family's struggling spiritually, lead, man. Lead them. Take them somewhere. It's in you. It's in you. It's in you. It's, it's in you. You have the heart of a warrior. Do something about it. Some of you, you've been getting crushed in a very private, lust filled battle. 
looking at fake images and videos for years, robbing you of what you really want, true intimacy, stripping you of something you haven't had in years, spiritual confidence to walk in strong. I am a man of God. I am a warrior. Listen, you don't win years later when you conquer. You win today, today. You don't win six months from now when you drop 30 pounds. You win when you look at that piece of cake and say, get thee behind me, chocolate cake, in the name of Jesus, today! <laughs> you don't win when you pay off your credit card and your second credit card and your third credit card and your car payment and your other car payment and your student loan payment and your second mortgage and your first mortgage. Ah! 23 years from now you win. No, you win when you live beneath your means today and you put a little bit extra toward that debt today. It's a step forward, you win today. You don't become some spiritual giant when you've memorized three books of the Bible. Oh, listen to me quote God's word. You win when you open up the YouVersion Bible app and you get in God's word and your streak says one because you did it today. And tomorrow it says two and the next day it says three because you're growing in God's word today. You don't win whenever you can say, I haven't looked at porn for three years. You win when you confess your sins to someone today and say, I've been trapped for a long time and I don't wanna be trapped a moment longer. You win today. What I know about um, many of you is you've never had an example of a godly warrior. There's never been a man close to you who's really fought for righteousness and had honor and deep and lasting integrity. For some of you, the men in your life, your examples, the warriors in your life, they were on one of two extremes. Some of them were incredibly passive, disengaged emotionally, uninvolved, weak, weak spiritually. On the other side, some of you, all you saw was anger and abuse. Neither one of those would be a godly warrior. Some of you, you've never had a man that you respect tell you, you're now a man. You're not just a man, you can be a man of God. You've never heard someone tell you you're a warrior. And for whatever it's worth, I want you to hear this, not as if it's me speaking to you, but if it's God speaking into you, gentlemen, if you're in Christ, you have what it takes. You have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling within you. You have the heart of a warrior. You've got spirituals, to, you've got spiritual weapons with which to wage war against the forces of darkness. You have the power of God's living word. Joel says this, may this be your cry. May you respond to the heart of God when Joel said this, he said, say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Call out your best warriors. Let all your fighting men advance for the attack. Hammer your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Train even your weaklings to be warriors. Come quickly, all you nations everywhere. Get together in the valley and now, O oh Lord, call out your warriors. Listen to me. When darkness pushes back, you step in and you fight. Sometimes you turn a cheek, other times you turn the table. It may be time to throw a punch. You've got the power of prayer, the power of your testimony, the power of the Spirit of God. You look at the enemy and say, take your hands off my family, take your hands off my finances, take your hands off my future, take your hands off my witness. If the men in your life were characterized by lying, or cheating, or passivity, or lust, you just declare, it stops with me, and it stops today. My God has given me the heart of a warrior. Sometimes it's time to throw a punch, and I believe by faith there's somebody here tired of getting pushed around. With the power of Christ, you will fight back. Father, we ask that you would raise up some warriors, men and women, with someone to protect, a kingdom to advance, and a battle to win. At all of our churches, those who say there is a battle, I can name it, I know what it is. 
and I need the power of God to help me win this battle. You know what your battle is? Lift up your hands right now, just lift them up. All of our churches, lift them up, lift them up right now. Father, give us strength by the power of the risen Christ to vanquish the enemy and to win the battles before us. We thank you, God, that victory isn't just what we accomplish in the future, but victory is being faithful and obedient today. As you keep praying today at all of our churches, I want you to know there's a battle going on for some of you right now, a spiritual battle. The forces of darkness versus the forces of light. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God, who was without sin, who died on a cross in our place and God raised him from the dead, why? Because anyone, and this includes you, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done, anyone, who calls on the name of Jesus would be saved. All of our churches, which side are you on? Either you're for God, or if you're not for him, you're against him, which side are you on? Are you ready to do battle? Like, are you ready to engage? Are you ready to get in the war? Because Jesus gave his life, not only so you could be saved from your sins, but so you could be saved for your mission with a kingdom to advance and a person to protect and a battle to win at all of our churches. Those of you who would say, I need his forgiveness, I need his grace. I want to live out his purpose. Today, I turn from my past. I turn from my sins. I turn toward Jesus. I give him my life. And all of our churches, those who say, yes, I need him. I need his power. I need his strength. I need his mercy. I need his grace. I turn from my sins. I call on Jesus today. Today, I give my life to him. That's your prayer. Lift your hands high now all over the place and say yes. Up here, right back here in the middle section. And others of you today say yes. Right back over here and over here on this side, right here as well. Praise God for you up here. Come on, church. Do we have any warriors who want to give God some praise today? Others of you right back up here in this section saying yes to Jesus. Church online, you click right below me. I would love it if some warriors, men and women, would stand to your feet and agree with me in prayer. Would you stand all around the auditoriums today and join those around you in prayer? Pray, Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. Jesus, save me and make me new. Help me engage in the battle to push back the darkness and to glorify you in all that I do. My life is not my own. I give it to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Could somebody worship big, let out a war cry, celebrate the goodness of God, new life in Christ. Hey, thanks for joining us here at Life Church. You know, as a church, it's always our heart to see you continue to grow in your relationship with Christ. We have a great resource to help you do that. It's called life.church slash next. There you can find all kinds of resources to help you continue to grow in your relationship with Christ. And we'd love for you to subscribe and be a part of our online community. Again, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.